Yup, we're doing it. We're talking about this shit again. I've always wanted to talk about Roselli ever since I made that 48 minute video. And I wanted to talk about them in that 48 minute video. But due to scope limitations, I have to unfortunately cut that part out of the equation. They are a special part of the game for me. Firstly, their music. Bang Dream has a lot to choose when it comes to the specific genre of idol influenced J pop rock it excels at. Roselli in particular focuses on professional sounding gothic rock, and they slap. Very cool, very epic, no questions asked. Second, and what we're going to go through in this video, their story. Roselli is a group formed out of grief. It starts with an overambitious goal with no clear way of reaching it and band members that have completely different motives. The story always captivates me even as a VTuber Life 2D visual novel. It's a good story if I do say so myself. While yes, I will admit, the story for the other bands are also really good. I'm just saying Roselia is my favorite. In any case, the game story is always just that, a game story, a visual novel that you unlock by playing a bit of the game. The story on its own is not exactly the most accessible, nor is it the most immersive. So of course, when I've heard they're making a movie out of them, I was ecstatic. I mean, it's my grills going through a high school crisis, on the big screen. But in a regular old anime movie way, it wasn't accessible for us non-Japanese people. In fact, you can't even get rips of it. That is until one year later. So, uh, how was the movie? It's, uh, it's, it's fine. I said it's amazing in my original video on Bandori, but after scrutinizing it for too long, I have come to the conclusion that it's just okay. I'm just gonna say this up front, it had a good concept. It's an adaptation of the game story. This story of a girl in this blind grief chasing a dream so distant that it might as well doesn't exist. But the way the movie conveys it is a bit problematic, especially for a standalone viewing. It expects you to already know the story in the first place. This movie is, at best, a rushed out story recap. At worst, it speed ran their arc so much that on its own it would be pretty impossible to get invested in any of it, not to mention the myriad of other things that it skipped. Which is honestly a shame, I like Roselia's story, and indeed this movie did a decent job at compiling it into one somewhat digestible format had I need to experience it all again. But due to how it is, unfortunately I can't just recommend this to people because of the prerequisites required to even understand what's going on. Which is where I and this video come in. I always wanted to do a commentary on Roselia in full detail. This video will both talk about its story and hopefully provide additional context as to what actually happened, and also me expressing my general thoughts on it. You'll soon realize why this took me almost two years to script and it's as long as it is. There's just something special about them, which makes me all the more upset to find out the movie was made. You see, Roselia wasn't formed to be a fun after-school band activity. It was made to fulfill a promise. The story of Roselia starts with her. Yukina Minato has a passion for music. Her specialty is singing. She has loved music ever since she was fresh from the womb. And indeed, she has a sort of natural skill for it ever since the early days. Part of that love is her father, a well-respected musician. He introduced her to music, and therefore is a big part of what makes Yukina Yukina. But eventually he got burned out. The record label he worked with wasn't the nicest, demanding workloads with unreasonable schedules. It got overwhelming, until one day he just stopped doing music. Yukina felt like she lost a big part of what makes her herself. Over the years, she would then grow to be a lot harsher to her peers. One of the things her father wants to do when he's still doing music is perform at Future World Fest, a big prestigious event. And since he couldn't do that anymore, Yukina felt a sort of moral obligation. She would then promise to her father, she will perform at FWF. She founded Roselia as a way to fulfill that promise, to find other people to work with, to join her in this wild ambition to get big in the music industry. It's going to be a bit of a challenge since Yukina is a bit picky when it comes to the player's actual ability. And since by this point, she's not exactly the nicest kid on the block. Along with her came a childhood friend, Lisa Imai. She sort of got dragged into Yukina's inherited passion for music. Eventually, she picked up the bass. While Yukina grew colder as the time went by, Lisa is still as jolly as ever. She's a caring person, an older sister figure that you can rely on. She always stays by Yukina's side. But eventually, they just kinda drifted apart. 
Lisa was concerned for Yukina. Yes, of course, she's supportive, but she's having doubt if Yukina would be okay if she goes on like this. Unable to move on. Stuck with a failure that's not even hers. Driving her into a wild goal that seems so ambitious, so unrealistic that it would make sense to just stop. It is worth noting while she is part of Rosalia. She is the least musically skilled of them all. She is barely able to meet up with Yukina's standards, but what she lacks in technical skill, she makes up for it by making sure the band doesn't fall apart. Her caring and understanding nature is what glues the band together. Immediately, these two set up an interesting dynamic. A grieving girl that wants to avenge her father by unrealistic means, and a caring childhood friend that grew concerned over her feelings. Yukino wants to reach her distant dreams by all means necessary, and Lisa was sort of got dragged along. She wants to be closer to Yukina but can't help but think if this is really the way to go. And the only way she can think of mediating it is to stay by her side and see what happens. Eventually, they manage to convince one other member to join. Sayo Hikawa, a guitarist. Much like Yukina, she's a gold girl with uber high standards. She was in a band before but left because she's just too good for them. She wants to level up her guitar playing after all. And she thought playing with a mediocre band would just stagnate her process. <sighs> okay, okay, alright, I need we, we, we need to go for this real quick. You might have noticed the 2D looking band members and probably the out of place crowds. I tried ignoring it for the past couple of minutes, but I, I, I just need to bring it up. Now, every single time I brought the Sanzigan Studio CG, I just gotta mention this. The 2D characters are just... No, 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 no. no. Did you notice the totally not CG crowds? Do you guys notice how out of place they are? Come on man, it can't be that hard making one generic model and giving them different textures or something. I understood why they did it on D4DJ and the Bandori anime series since they got 13 episodes to animate but like come on, this is a movie. It has a movie budget. On launch, the tickets to an online screening of this movie is 20 whole dollars. The CG looks nice, I'll give them that, but goodness gracious does the 2D ones look out of place. The absolute opposite of seamless. To be fair, even Studio Orange messes this up sometimes, but come on. Come on. Okay, so part of the reason why she wants to get better at guitar is to set herself apart from her sister, Hina Hikawa, who also plays guitar in her own idol band Pastel Palettes. At first, Sayo thought nothing of it, but when she realized Hina is improving at an alarming rate, she felt like she had lost part of what made her special. She desperately tries to one-up Hina in this regard, in turn making her a lot more aggressive and touchy in general. We're going to go back to the relationship of these two later, but for now, let it be known that Sayo and Hina aren't exactly close to each other. In Rosalia, Yukina practically begged her to join. She was so impressed by Sayo's performance that she had no doubt she'll be fit for the occasion. Likewise, the reason Sayo is convinced to join Yukina in her wild dreams is that she's impressed by Yukina's singing. This mutual admiration, maybe with both of their powers they can conquer the world. Eventually, word spread around that Yukina is forming a band and one peculiar person immediately applies to join. Ako Udagawa, a drummer. She's inspired by her sister Tomoe Udagawa, who also plays the drums. Another sibling relationship, but this time one of mutual admiration instead of an inferiority-superiority type situation. Ako always wants to be in a band, but has never gotten the chance to do so. When she heard that Yukina is looking for band members, she immediately goes to work. She's been a fan of Yukina for a while, and she could not pass up the chance to be a part of it. Ako is a Junibio. Basically, she acts like she lives in a fantasy world with magical powers, even if she's not exactly fluent with her magical words. But her desire to join Roselia isn't a fantasy. She practiced really hard, visibly bruising her hand in the process, all in the hopes that Yukina would maybe get her into the team. Yukina was understandably reluctant. She's looking for the best of the best here. How can a random middle schooler with an 8th grader syndrome do it? But after some consolation with Lisa, they agreed to let Ako audition one time. And if she fails that one time, there would, there would be no second chance. And she did surprisingly well actually. After all that, she's finally in Yukina's perfect band party. Ako is the first member here to get into the band that doesn't come from Yukina's interest. The way she came on here isn't because Yukina just so happened to know her or saw her performance and exclaimed, Okay, you're mine now, I'm taking you home. Ako had to practically start from scratch to catch the eyes of Yukina. It's not explained in the movie, but Ako pitched herself to Yukina over the course of a week, probably more. And that's not counting all the practice she does outside of it. Pestering Yukina to give her a chance, even just once, and to everyone's surprise, it kinda pays off. Ako's way of getting into Roselia is a reminder of just how high Yukina's standard is, and how serious she is with her ambition to get big. So, to recap. 
We got a lone wolf vocalist, a Nesson type bassist, inferiority complex guitarist, and a childlike Chunibyo drumist. What else was there to do? Oh yeah, keyboarder. Where on a screen earth would they find a keyboard player worthy of Yukina's standard? So, uh, turns out Ako knows somebody, whom she met on an online game they play. Rinko Shirokane is a pianist. It is implied that she excels in that field. She participated and won in various competitions, but eventually she lost interest. Probably burned out from all the peer pressure, Rinko is a shy person. She never really talks to anyone. To the layman watching, she is much less of a bocce but more of a Mio Akiyama. She is more of a PA son if she is actually productive in high school. The chill kind of introvert with less visible panic attacks. As such, for people that are close to her, in this case Ako, she is more willing to listen. As of now, she never really touched the piano anymore. She never brought it up. And no one even knows that she plays the piano. So how does Ako know about her piano playing? She doesn't. Ako just called a friend she has on her contacts and asked if they know any keyboard slash piano player on hand. Rinko was a bit hesitant to say it but eventually she came clean to Ako. She plays piano and she's willing to give it a shot. Maybe she can have fun with it again. The band was understandably kinda concerned. This girl looks like she would collapse if you told her to get groceries and talk to the cashier. And unfortunately the mango box wasn't invented until 2 years later. But Ako had faith. It's fine. It's gonna be fine. And it's, it's fine. It's fine. Amazing, in fact. Maybe it's the fact that they're playing together, so it's much easier to get on the beat and just vibe. They're playing in harmony, complementing each other on the fast four-year transform spectrum. Definitely much more fun than playing solo. So far, the story of Roselia has been going great. Its five members all contain their own motives and priorities, but they all manage to set their differences aside and join Yukina in this weird dream of hers. Now you would think that a band of misfits like this would be problematic. And you're right, after they get together in the movie, a montage was shown their ups and downs and it shows stuff. I mean it shows Lisa screwing up a show so that's something I guess. Also Sayo and her sister it seems. Oh they're talking on a balcony now, what did they talk about? Now this montage was often criticized for skipping ahead too much. And you know, I can somewhat agree, it has something to do with how this movie told its story. It assumes you already know the game story in the first place, and thus it tends to gloss over the details. I'm retelling the story as it goes but I'm honestly filling a lot of the blanks. The whole prologue about Yukina's father failing to perform at FWF? It was merely a brushed over topic, a passing conversation. It's actually impossible to relate to her father, let alone Yukina's wild dreams to become big. And this whole thing in general too, and honestly if I mention every time I'm filling the blanks, it would totally ruin the pacing of this video. Now about that montage, I mentioned before that these two movies are adaptations of the game story. This one in particular is a rough summary of Rosella's band story chapter 1, Bloom of the Blue Rose. The first band formation on the first half of it was explained in great detail, the rest of it didn't, and those arguably also contain detrimental things to the story. This montage mostly refers to when Yukino was invited by a talent scout to perform in Future World Fest, alone, as a solo vocalist, leaving her friends behind. And the whole drama was, is if she would take the shortcut, the coward's way out, or stay with Roselia, stay with her friends. Another wild thing it just glossed over is, remember that Future World Fest thing, the big prestigious stage? They actually participated in the FWF contest here. Not exactly the main event itself, but more like an audition of sorts. They perform well, but they're rejected because they're quote still new and they can still improve to even greater heights. It's a good story, but again, the movie just doesn't care about it. So I mentioned in the beginning of this video that I'm going to explain the plot. But there comes a point where one must acknowledge their limitations. This video is specifically about the episode of Rosalia. Not explaining Rosalia lore 100% complete speedrun glitchless not clickbait featuring MatPat from Game Theory. If I had to explain everything in Band Story 1 and more, that would add another 30 minutes to this already too long video. So unfortunately, we have to fast for a bit to compensate. Ultimately, aside from subtle character development, I don't think the latter arcs in this movie relies too heavily on the skip bits. This is actually one of the times it did that, but it is still worth noting that there are more to this. There is a silver lining to this though. If for some reason you decide to check the rest of the story out yourself, you can hopefully live the experience on your own. If you're into visual novels and maybe idol rhythm games that is. But for now, let's just assume they went through ups and downs together and a few months has passed since then because what about to come next is nothing short of a trip. Remember when I said that a band of misfits like this would be problematic? Well... 
Roselli was invited to Sweet Music Shower, SMS for short, a relatively big event. At this point in time, Roselli ever only performs in small time venues, but a chance to perform at a proper event with a decently sized audience? This could be a turning point for Roselli. A lot of bands that perform in Future World Fest perform here first, so a Sweet Music Shower is no child's play. It is a huge event, but something was off. They sounded not as good as they're used to. It seems like the audience did not care much for them. Obviously, they screwed up somewhere, but what? Everyone felt like they played their part. All we know is that the staff mentioned they were quote, a bit nervous. Yukina didn't take this lightly. You know how she is with failure. Eventually, she came a lot more aggressive, even more so than usual. They kept on practicing and practicing without knowing what it is they're missing. One in particular that got hit by Yukina's aggression the most is Akko, scolding her for not keeping the tempo or lacking expression. This goes on for days until eventually Akko snaps. Did I ever tell you the definition of insanity? And you know, Akko has a point. They kept on practicing over and over again without knowing or reflecting exactly what went wrong. All this practice, but for what reason? To get better at what? They don't actually know what aspect of themselves to get better at. They just kept on doing root drilling until somehow magically they fixed the issue. That's the definition of insanity. Just doing the same thing over and over, expecting things to change. Yukina gets even more mad at her, saying that she better off just quit the band if she doesn't want to practice. Until finally... <laughs> Hinko followed. She said... Remember how she was at the beginning? Compared to how she is now, oh, such character development, I love her. It was at this point I should probably mention, Rinko, despite how silent she is, has always been paying attention to the band the most. She's an introvert that can somewhat read the room per se. She noticed that something was off even from the beginning. She felt like after that time, everyone was so hung up on that failure that they forgot to, oh, uh, I don't know, pay attention to each other? Before this, Yukina actually started to get along with her band members. But now she's such in distraught that she went back to her old self, being harsh and not caring with the outcome. The whole band too was actually in a good state. Roselia actually got by fine. Akko and Rinko still play games together. Lisa even promises to make cookies with Sayu, and Yukina is supposedly hyped about it. But alas, I think this failure got the better of her. She's a bit silly, isn't it? Eventually, she came clean to the others about her change in behavior. She doesn't know what to do. She's turning back to her old self in vain, hoping that it would revert back to how it was. But that isn't going to magically fix how they are. It would only make it worse. Yukina is now distraught, clueless, and now powerless. Until suddenly, someone showed up. Yukina, senpai? She is Kasumi from Poppin' Party, and they're on their way on their next concert. Seeing Yukina like this, she can't help herself but to invite Yukina to join. <sighs> okay, so uh, this movie really doesn't going to explain anything to anyone. Yukina is a bit of an airhead. She doesn't know jack shit, despite how she looks. Hence the I don't need cookies line. Even for me, sometimes I got lost and I have to call a friend to figure out what it is they're referencing. It's a bit of a reoccurring problem in this. Truthfully, the next bit won't require too much context as it is kind of surface level and you might be able to tell just by watching it on its own. But just so we're on the same page, here's a quick review on Poppin' Party. Poppin' Party has a completely different philosophy. The extroverted hyperactive Kasumi found something special about performing a band and tries to convince her friends to join. In her presence, Arisa, Rimi, Tae, and Saya eventually join. It took her a persuasion and a half to convince them, but they formed a band. Pop and Body was made for the hell of it, in contrast to Roselia, which was made with intent. But also in contrast to Roselia, since Pop and Body was already, in essence, a band formed around friendship, they have a completely different motive. Who cares if they aren't perfect? As long as they can hang out and vibe with each other. As long as they can have fun. They are happy with themselves. This shows in their performances. While of course it's not perfect, but since they had fun with each other, the audience had no issues to have fun with them too. And this works. Everyone that loved them, loved them. Just the sheer joy that they emit with each other was enough to compensate for their lack of experience. And also the fact that the joy they emit was contagious amongst their audiences. Watching their show, you can realize something different about them. After the concert, you can ask them what goes on in their head when they perform. And they all responded with, I love Poppypa. And it made sense. If you are working with something that you love, you can be a lot more effective in it. You care about it more. And you have more incentive to get better at it. 
and it shows, really. The issue with Rosalia now is that because Yukina is such an asshole that is so full of herself, she doesn't care about anyone, as long as she could perform in that dream stage of hers. She forgot how she needs to care about her members too. That's the part of aiming for that perfect sound. They can't just wing it individually and hope for the best. A band is a result of teamwork. To get the team to perform better, they would need to actually work together. To get the band together, they need to actually care and listen to each other's sound. On the other hand, Akko is still depressed. She eventually asks her sister Tomoe for help. Tomoe plays the band too, Afterglow. That too was based on friendship. It was made to keep themselves from drifting further apart. Of course, they have hardships, but staying together is the first step of overcoming it. Tomoe is extremely wise and mature, often mistaken for being way older than she actually is, and has the same actor as Koyagami from New Game. In fact, the VA probably uses the same part of her vocal cord for this because I kept mistaking one for the other whenever I hear them talk. God, I love you, Kohikasa. I love you so much. I have a sneaking suspicion that New Game and Bang Dream are related somehow, a bit closer than that mid pastel palettes cover, but that's a story for another day. Tomoe told Akko to express her love somehow. I mean, her feeling concerned about the band is proof that she cared. If she could somehow show that feeling to others, maybe they can be together again. Akko told Rinko about that statement and proceeded to pitch. A new costume design. Maybe if they make cool costumes, Rosella would be together again. Uh, okay, okay, pause, pause, hold the phone. We need to catch up with a few things again. Rinko is very skilled at playing the piano and by extension keyboards. The musical kind and the computer kind, as evident with her gamer skills. But she can also sew stuff. It was back on that first chapter of this whole saga. She offered to make costumes for the band and understandably surprised everyone. Making in-theme cute frilly costumes that adds to the theming of the performances is their shtick. It's what they do. This was implied- not even implied, the movie straight up did not say about Rinko's ability to make costumes, let alone why they made them in the first place. So anyway, they wanted to make another costume. Maybe if they make something cooler this time, it would help the situation. Meanwhile, Sayo and Lisa finally figured out what Rinko might have meant when she says Roselia is quote not listening to each other's sound. Everyone of Roselia has their own motives, remember. Yukina does it because of her father, Lisa does it just to follow Yukina, and Sayo does it to prove something to her sister. Not that these motivations are incompatible, it's just that lately there's something going on that made them lose track of each other. Remember how Akko and Rinko was the one joining this band purely because of themselves and not because Yukina asked them to? They realized that both of them might know something they don't. Sayo and Lisa would then have found out about the costume project and began discussing about what to do. This... this is a... This is a long and winded dialogue, I swear to god. The jarring thing about this movie is because it's basically a VN with shiny visuals. The movie loves to tell with words that yes, Yukina here is having her 10th fit today. The movie has this terrible issue with pacing. I get it, the story needs to be rewritten in the context of a theatrical, but for some parts they made it into a dialogue tell don't show affair and the rest they just didn't bother to show it. This whole conversation lasts for 2 minutes and 20 seconds. You, you can feel every millisecond of it and it can all be summed up with Okay, so we f***ed up. Let's not do that again. But we have feelings of love for it now, so let's keep that feeling. Those four figured it out at least, but at what cost? There's just one more person to take care of. There she is. The bitch. Okay, but f***ing why don't you do that earlier? The map, bro, that's all you got there. Ah, oh, look at her standing up for herself. Ah, yes, I like her very much. Basically, the fact that Yukino was even concerned for the band as a group, a music group, a band if you will, shows that Yukino also has feelings for the band, for her bandmates, her friends. If she didn't care, she could probably start from ground zero and look for someone else, but instead she held that burden of losing her current members. She absolutely does not want that to happen, she does not want to part ways. All this time, she's acting almighty on her friends, but turns out she deeply cares about them. And when she's unable to do anything, she's embarrassed to even show that side of her to anyone else. Rinko exclaims that, We are Roselia. If Roselia is in trouble, we should look for the solution together. No one person should need to held all that burden on their own. So, to put a long story short, they're finally together. They found out what it means to actually care for each other. This whole line of events led up to the creation of new aspect which is all about going back to the light after darkness, where time felt like it just stops with no chance of going forward and progressing. 
but even in our darkest times, all we need is to trust each other and keep going. Because while we can't stand on our own, if we put our efforts together, then nothing will stand a chance against us. Man, I'm reading this as if I have friends. <laughs> <laughs> With this, they are ready to go back on stage. But before their next concert, Inko said that she will be revising her costume. She added clocks and cogs as the cores. It's a bit unusual for Rosalia since at this point they were all about shining crystals and blooming flowers. But that entire drama essentially stopped them in time. They weren't going anywhere until they eventually came back together as one, as Rosalia. In which point the cog started turning and the clock starts to tick once more. This new motif stands a new era for Azalea, where they are no longer a group filled with self-centered members only thinking about themselves, but a group filled with passion and love. At least that's what it sounds like, until they inevitably screw something up again. Oh, 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 what the f- Okay, so there's 20 minutes of the movie left, let's just get this over with. Lisa isn't the most skillful in a group. Her base skills was just there, and understandably she felt inferior to her peers. She wants to do more for the band. Sayo notices something is up with Lisa and asks her what's up. Lisa said she felt like she is the most inadequate of the band. You can even said she's just barely good enough to be a supporting bass. She tried to write lyrics as an honest effort to help Roselia a bit more. But alas, apparently that too wasn't enough. Lisa laughed at the situation. I mean really, what else can she do? But Sayo didn't find it funny. Here's the thing. While yes, Lisa isn't the most technically skilled bass player in the team, she was in fact very important to the team in other ways. Lisa is a caring person, so much so she is very much the mother figure of the band, keeping everything in check so that nothing goes to flames. In fact, this one time she left practice to fill in job shift and everything goes to flames. So yeah, she's kind of important. Sayo took offense to the whole self-deprecation thing because Lisa already had a role. She practically did everything here to keep everyone from going insane again. And now Lisa said she's still inadequate. W what more does this woman want? Lisa apologized to Sayo, but it seems like at this point in time, she wouldn't forgive Lisa just yet. Alright then, Lisa has something to prove now. That night, Sayo felt uh, guilty. I, she, she, she said that whole rant out loud. Like she genuinely said to the, at the time, the press Lisa Imayo that, F and what more do you want? Her sister Hina notices something is up with Sayo. Sayo said that she is fine, to which Hina replied with, Hey mate, that ain't your everything is fine face. Sayo explained the situation. She was worried that she might be too harsh on Lisa, setting her further down the drain instead of actually helping. Hina remembered something. Okay, so notice how these two are a bit closer together now? What happened there exactly? Well, this is one of those things that movie doesn't explain and it's relatively important to the plot. Hina and Sayo are twin sisters and they weren't exactly close to each other. You know, general sibling stuff. Sayo is a blunt, harsh person wanting something to prove and Hina is a bright but still blunt girl that just wants everyone to have fun. Their contrasting personalities isn't compatible, they thought. Sayo one day learned the guitar, mastered it even. Being the slightly older one of the two, she felt like she had a one-up to Hina. This will be the thing that distinguishes her from one another. But then she found out Hina also does the guitar for the idol group she's in, Pastel Palette. At first she thought nothing of it, but then she quickly realized that Hina is improving very quickly. Her playing has a lot more life to it. It sounds like she's actually having fun. Sayo felt like she's going to be overshadowed by her sister, eventually becoming the inferior one. Hina on the other hand is happy to have the same passion as her sister. She wanted to be closer to Sayo after all, and she thought this would be the thing that finally brings them together. But it doesn't seem that way to Sayo. The whole reason she even played the guitar was to prove something to Hina, to be the special one. And now that Hina plays it too, and apparently to such a degree that Sayo felt herself being inferior listening to Hina's playing, she found no more reason to keep playing. Upon hearing this, Hina was furious. This is the one avenue where she can feel closer together. And now Sayo is quitting just because she is feeling inadequate to her sister. She is quitting specifically to separate herself from Hina. Hina has none of this. All she wanted is to just get along with each other. Up until this point, they just had nothing in common. Now that they do have a common goal, Sayo is just gonna throw it away. Hina said to her sister she is willing to get blamed, she is willing to get hurt, she is willing to do anything. As long as Sayo continues to play the guitar, unhindered by Hina's apparent superiority. She wanted them to play together. But if she insists on quitting, then that's it. They would no longer have that bond, and Hina will keep continuing to hate her sister, if that's what Sayo wants. Sayo contemplated. She understood what Hina meant. She finally suppressed her desire to quit and eventually Sayo promised, both of them promised, they would keep performing together. 
So what does this have to do with Sayo lashing at Lisa? Well, if it wasn't for Hina speaking up to Sayo, she'll probably give up on the guitar now. Likewise, if Sayo just pampered Lisa any further, it would not help the situation to anyone. Lisa could have fallen down the rabbit hole and just give up. And as the last act would show, we definitely don't want that. Yes, of course one might not be the best in a particular field compared to their peers, but sometimes there's more to it than just being technically sound. Lisa thought she's holding everyone back with her skills, or lack thereof, where in reality, she holds a role not everyone can fill. Saya speaking up was actually detrimental, as evidenced with the message she received from Lisa. She managed to finally figure out what she's been missing. Lisa thanked her for the talk she gave that afternoon. Isa is now all fired up. She's motivated now. Sayo can now breathe a sigh of relief, knowing that Lisa is now cooking. Lisa is now thinking hard. She's back on the lyrics things again. Insert all the funny math thinking gifts in existence. A few moments ago, Lisa asked Akko for songwriting advice, to which she replied with, Try thinking of your life journey. Why am I here? What brings me to this very point? What line of events led me to this very moment? She now thinks about where it all began. In the beginning. No, earlier than that. Way, way earlier than that. <laughs> Needless to say, the lyrics came out great. Very warm, very chill, nice imagery, everyone likes it. Yakusoku, promise. It's about trust. To support each other, to lurch further into the future. To not worry about failure because the more we get through them, the stronger we get. To trust each other until the promised scenery of a white flower field. To never give up until that promise has been fulfilled. To believe that better days are coming. It's quite nice imagery if I do say so myself. Lisa is now done with her self-deprecation facade. She will keep going at this Rosalia thing until the end. She had been given trust by everyone. And she promises not to break that trust. A few moments ago, Yukina rejected Lisa's draft, noting she would not sing them. But now, she was able to immediately conjure up a melody. Yep, this is it lads, they'll be playing this next live. New song, yay. Also, this song is a banger. Look, I know I said that every time, but like, I swear this is amazing. You can notice is the fact that the lyrics was based off of the good old days. The days where things has not yet gone to sh**. So many things has changed since then, huh? She accepted the fact that those good old days are long past and they can never go back. But as long as they still remember it, it will still exist somewhere in their minds, in their heart. It will never truly be gone. Yukina no made a request to Lisa. If things ever continue to change, if they'll ever go off the rails again, if anything and everything happens, she wants Lisa to keep playing the bass alongside her. And that concludes episode 1, promise. W w what a ride, huh? It's a rocky start, but they finally can get over their differences. And you know, I like this very much. Being a fan of Rosalia already, I can definitely vibe to this movie, totally turning into their antics and their struggles. The story is kinda scattered in the game, so having a somewhat proper plot recap kinda helps me to re-experience the story in an immersive way. More immersive than the live 2D models and dialogue boxes, I mean. I love the story, and having it in this format really does help me understand the characters a bit more. But, I am still not kidding about this movie's over-reliance on supplementary reading. The only reason why I'm recapping the plot this thoroughly is that the movie itself skipped very important bits. It tries to convey so many things it didn't know what to keep and what to skip. That promise between Hina and Sayo? I said it before, but among other things, it's not in the movie. It was just barely explained. In fact, on my first viewing, I don't even know what they're talking about since the story is buried deep in-game. It's part of the umbrella for the Autumn Rain Time event story, and it's a trouble for me since that event happened long before I actually started playing the game. It's a mess. It has a good concept. The story that it tries to convey is amazing, but its execution is lacking. It wasn't accessible. I like it, but it's stupid hard to recommend because of just how it is. It's honestly another reason why this video takes so long. It's very difficult for me to actually figure out what the heck they're talking about. To piece together an actually coherent narrative that doesn't gloss over important bits. If it were me, I'd probably cut the Lisa arc and replace it with something a bit more general, instead of it being just about her. I would call that segment a bit problematic since it cuts the Neo aspect arc short while simultaneously adding 20 different chapters you need to be familiar with. I know it's part of Noble Rose, the event stories that will eventually lead up to the big event FWF. But I don't know, with how this movie is, what it sacrificed to get to that point, I'm 
kinda not sure. Let's talk about the 3D briefly. I went over Sanzigen CG multiple times in this channel and it's for a reason. Okay, it's for a few reasons. As such, I'm going to explain it just briefly here. It's, I don't know, something about this movie just screams rushed. Each of the scenes in this movie doesn't have a consistent quality. Pair it with a bit of an awkward framing that tries too hard to mimic the face close-ups of normal anime. I usually like them, and indeed, I think this is a bit of an improvement compared to their usual ones. But yeah, much like the story, the CG is a bit rough at times. That 2D character in 3D thing is very jarring. It was by no means seamless. You can tell if the characters are two-dimensional, and the crowds and stuff really doesn't look that nice. It's not to say that they didn't know how to blend the 2D well with the CG. I mean, have you noticed the frilly dress Lisa is wearing at this scene is 2D? I didn't. Overall though, I still enjoy it. It's rough, but it's very fun seeing my Rosalia girls in the third dimension. Let's go back to how these girls cope, because even though they are finally together, they are still missing something. While they are a Rosalia now, they still don't know what Rosalia is. Their next step is to look for something not much less important. Their identity. What is this title, Yoda speak? Anyways, this one is thankfully a lot less hectic, so it'll be much easier to explain on my end, and also the supplementary reading thing isn't as bad. It still does that, but to a much lesser extent. To start with, they are now one year older. Notice how the colors of their uniform change, and Akko's blazer changes colors. Yeah, the colors here signifies the year they're in, on the Haneoka school that is, the one with the blazers. Middle schoolers get the black one, and the high schoolers get the gray one. For the skirt and tie, green is first year, blue is second, brown is third. Cool little detail like that that makes me a bit mad the actual character school outfit designs don't have much variations. A actually, they don't have any variations. I mean, look at D4DJ. Look at how freely they can modify their uniform outfit. <laughs> Character design isn't that bad. Anyway, they're preparing for the next FWF contest. Last time, they did not make the cut because they're still new. Good, but they can still improve. Yukina is currently on writer's block. She wants to do a new song for the contest, but she could not come up with anything. She would then get invited to a kayaking trip with her fellow friends. How wholesome. Uh, not from Rosalia. Now, I wish I have a reason to introduce the other characters now, but we'll stumble upon the red streak hair girl later. And unfortunately, Hagumi from Hello Happy World and Rimi from Poppin' Party doesn't really have a presence. She was against it at first, but Lisa said to her, uh, maybe she should, um, I don't know, take a break? You know, I kinda didn't like this bit at first, since it doesn't advance the plot whatsoever, and as I mentioned previously, the movies are severely lacking in available runtime, but I feel like I've come to appreciate this part. Yukina had went through a major, major breakdown in the last movie. She needs a bit of a break, and it helps for us too since it more smoothly ramps up the intensity. It's not going to be as intense, but I think this is a nice change of pace. This trip actually has a bit more going on in the original game story. It was Sayo and Yukina that got invited by Hagumi. Lisa wanted to join too, but she has a part-time job shift. This whole trip was originally for Rimi to take pictures to send to her older sister, who lives overseas. They caught falling leaves together, they went to a reed pipe workshop where they learned how to play a reed pipe, they went to food stands, and they went kayaking. This is actually in the movie now. On that trip, they visited a shop where they can make postcards. Very cool. Where to Yukina is sending hers? Oh, she's sending it to herself. How brave. She said it's something something to remind her future self about the present, since by the time that postcard actually arrives to Yukina's house, probably weeks in the future, they have already done the FWF contest. She wanted to like, maybe just set a bit of a time capsule, just for the hell of it. Whether or not this actually helped Yukina got over her writer's block is questionable, but hey, at least she got a whole bunch of cool things from it, metaphorically and physically. Back on the studio, Akko installs a countdown timer on her phone until the event. She wants to hype herself up it seems, but in doing so, something slowly dawned on her. Rosalia is specifically made because Yukina wants to perform in Future World Fest. And the next contest to FWF is just around the corner. Whether or not they pass then is still a mystery, but if they do, what's next? What will become of Rosalia? Would they just disband, say farewell, and move on with their lives? So, Akko and Rinko plays an MMO, Neo Fantasy Online, or NFO for short. 
that's where they met basically. And being an MMO, the game had a quest system that the players can complete. Regular content updates would happen to give the player more quests. It's an MMO, you've seen an MMO. In Aqua's mind, Rosilla currently have a few quests. The contest, the girls band challenge, and finally the FWF itself. She's wondering whether or not Rosalia will undergo a content update much like the MMO she's playing. She doesn't want them to end just yet. She tried to cope by dividing those quests into smaller ones. So instead of it being just perform at contest, it's now get up from bed and walk to the live house, don't mess up the drums and such. Eventually, she consulted her sister Tomoe with her band Afterglow on whether or not the band has those goals like that. Tomoe said they didn't have anything like that. They do have a mindset though, to keep one aspect of everyday the same so they don't drift apart. She eventually built up the courage to ask the rest of Rosalia about what happens to the band once FWF is over. And it only took her a few days to finally ask that. You can that she also doesn't know, but she's still sure that the band will continue, no matter which path they choose. They will always be together. It may be scary not knowing what the future holds, but as long as they're together, they're going to be okay. So what happens if they drift apart? Well, like what happened with Neo Aspect last time, they can still be together again. Everyone in Rosalia now cares about the group, about each other, but especially in Rosalia, Akko, one with a pure, actual passion for the band, even all the way from the start. If it weren't for her, they would've probably disbanded a year ago. No one realized until in retrospect that her role in Rosalia is actually as important as anyone else. She's the one that truly knows what Rosalia is, unhindered by moral obligation or spite. And with that, Akko can now breathe a sigh of relief. Uh oh, I almost forgot that new song for the contest. Apparently Rinko made a song out of nowhere. Apparently she too wants to contribute more to the band. And also apparently her song got Yukina out of the writer's block. So yeah, they're playing Rinko's music now. Rinko said the motif of the song came from the idea of the five of us is what makes us. And she decided to expand upon it, to build it up further. And this was the result. That's an interesting take actually. Sudden bursts of inspiration can come from anywhere and anytime, especially if your day job is to create stuff. If you discovered an idea that really resonates with you, it's helpful to immediately build upon it. And usually stuff made from this sudden inspiration burst tends to come out a lot better and faster. There are moments when I either make music or those AMVs or even video scripts when the process is way smoother than usual. Due to the fact that because I resonated with the idea a lot, the whole thing just formed in my head. And also if the conditions are right and After Effects did not crash on me every 5 minutes, I enjoy working on the project better than anything else. Music is one of those things that are really seasonal. If you aren't inspired right at that second, it's really hard to materialize something out of thin air, or even to try and force yourself to get inspired again. So having Ringo here giving her song idea that is indeed related to how they do things really helped. And because of how fit it is to the theme, everyone agreed to continue to work on it together, pronto. This might seem like an unrelated tangent, and it is, but that is because this theme would kinda become prevalent again later in the movie. Currently, Yugina is lacking that spark. She's burned out and nothing really happens. She forced herself to come up with something for so long, but now she has new material, an inspiration, that spark. Although the song was originally made by Rinko for herself, turns out it was exactly what the band needed to continue going forward. You can accept that this song managed to make her feel like she had a faint glimpse of where they would go next. A glimpse of the future, if you will. And off they go performing in the FWF contest. And the results are... <laughs> Now this may sound like plot armor, like of course they would win, they're the main characters. But remember, this is not their only time performing, this is not their first time. They literally failed the last time they participate in this contest. Not to mention that entire shenanigan with the SMS thing. This is not beginner's luck, this is the result of pure sweat and hard work. And maybe possibly bloodshed. And yeah, I can't help but to root for them once more. This victory feels well, well deserved. Their hard work has finally paid off. And now, with the golden ticket received, they can now perform on the main stage. The stage they've been longing for so long. The big event is coming up. Yukina wanted to make new music for it. Trouble is, she, she, she's, she's on her writer's block again. She does that a lot, turns out. She's been working on it for so long, she forgot what she wanted the song to be in the first place. Hey, that's just like how this video came about. Boy, I sure do love scrapping 5 drafts of 15,000 word scripts over the course of 2 years. Sayo told her to uh, look for advice. Oh, 
Oh, thank you, Sayuriko, for your world-class advice, passing it on to someone else. No, what she meant is, there's probably a few things that we only notice if someone else points it out to us. For Sayo, her sister said that she's her own best cheerleader. She's better motivated if she just does it on her own pace. That's what Hina said to her. Yukina now looks for someone else. Introducing Ranmi Take, the lead of Afterglow. She had a lot in common with Yukina actually. Both are pretty cool with others, has incredible demands, have a very specific vision of themselves that they wanted to be, and both have daddy issues. Meeting her at the school rooftop where Ran usually does her songwriting sessions, Ran told her to think for yourself. Oh, oh my god, thank you, you're, you're such a genius oh, coming up with that. Oh my god, holy sh I can never come up with that level of absolute intellect. No, but before we can understand what she meant, let's go down a bit on her lore. Because as you probably know by now, the movie won't going to give you anything. Ran Mitake is a bit of a stubborn person. Again, a bit like Yukina. She only does things she specifically wants to. That is to say, if you told her to clean her bedroom, she will tell you to f*** off before doing it on her own terms. Not exactly, but you get what I mean. See, she has a passion in music, right? I mean, she is the vocalist and the lead guitarist of Afterglow after all, but her dad wants her to do flower arranging instead. You know, typical Asian parent demands. At first, she hated it. She doesn't want to do it in the slightest. But as time went on, as it became clear that the band will be just fine if she also do flower arranging in her free time, and also knowing how apparently important it is to her father, she eventually came to love it, and now she does it of her own free will. What does this have to do with her advice to Yukina? Well, I'ma be blunt real quick, the movie did a terrible job of explaining it. The dialogue only consists of Yukina asking for advice, Ran talks about her flower arranging gig for two sentences, and that's it. No more, no less. But basically, she said that Yukina needs to be able to choose things for herself. She needs to do things of her own will, not just because she was obligated to, but specifically because they're content with their choices, even if it takes a while to love it. Oh hey, that could be a song idea. And there she goes working on the song. She she is songwriting. This this is how she writes the songs. Uh, courtesy of Lisa. She 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 said that this is how her friends write. Uh, I have no clue either. I mean I mean if it works, it works, right? I should probably try that with my scripts one day. Hey, if Kasumi immediately tries this method when she hears this, maybe it's a sign that it's effective after all. Apparently her songwriting session went well, and the lyrics came out amazing! It is said to be more piercing than usual. Song I Am. It's about how they got here, how they become what they are, but now that they are here, they will now continue onwards themselves. No longer will they need to be constantly taken care of, they can take care of themselves. They now understand what they are, and hopefully the path that lies ahead will shine. Lisa said it feels like a continuation of Ladder, a song that came from Yukina's father and supposedly started this whole saga. Have I explained this bit? No, I waited until the very end of the video to say it. Ah, uh, damn, that sucks. Louder was a song which Yukina inherited from her father. Now, in contrast to Song I Am, where that one was mostly about growing up, Louder was about how reliant the character is to their significant other, about where once everything was darkness and sadness, how it looked like things weren't going to get better, but with a little guidance and trust, it's no longer the case. They can feel alive once more. They don't need to cry no more, and they can continue moving on forward. A nice little imagery, isn't it? Someone taking care of someone else until eventually that someone else can stand up for themselves. Ladder does indeed feels like a prequel to Song I Am, and it's beautiful in a way. Then Sayo comes up with a brilliant idea. If it does indeed looks like the two songs have a timeline, then perhaps Neo Aspect is what lies between the two, the one that connects the past to the present. Because as a quick refresher, New Aspect was roughly about the struggles of getting up again after being let down, and New Aspect being the introduction of cogs and clocks implying time that keeps moving forward. So with that in mind, a set list was born. Louder, the past, the one that starts everything, the foundation of which Roselia was built, New Aspect, the present, the struggles in between, and how we need to work together to overcome that struggle, and Song I Am. The future. Now that we're more mature, we can now continue moving forward and continue making a path for ourselves. It was until this point we finally see what Yukina wrote to herself. Furikaeru koto naku, mae. Don't look back, move forward. Today's the day, it's the thing, it's the moment you've been waiting for. The future world fest. A stage where Yukina's father wants aspires to be on. A stage where Roselia aspires to be on, and in a few hours, a stage where Roselia will be on. This is it, in a few seconds, Roselia will reach its original intended reason to exist. And moving forward, Yukina no longer needs the assistance of her father. Nay, she doesn't need to be overshadowed by her father's failure. 
by stepping on this stage, by closing the book on their past selves, they will now reach the peak and they will now go further than they once foreseen. The thing that's special about this movie, you know, this whole series in general, is how it's able to consistently make me feel proud of the characters' accomplishments. Yes, they're fictional characters, and of course that's what fiction is meant to do, but like, they just felt real to me. It feels like there really is a Rosalia out there making music and putting them on my YouTube music out of play. I can totally fly with their struggles. Now remember, the story is used to be spread out across months in game and various event stories and such, so it feels more real to me than if you're a hypothetical person that just watches the movie. But still, this is why I like the series so much, and by extension this movie too actually, even if it has a few flaws. I mentioned on the previous part that the movie is very worthy. Is it better on this one? Uh, no, it's actually worse. It's very worthy. My summary is a bit lengthy too, but honestly, I'm only rephrasing what the characters said. There aren't any new visuals per se. This part is where it really starts to feel like a visual novel with 3D models as visuals. It feels like you're watching a cutscene from Genshin or Honkai, and not the cinematic ones. It's all just dialogue, there are no implied emotions here. They all said everything there is to say. I'm half convinced you can listen to this movie like a podcast, and provided you know Japanese, you won't be missing a thing. It's very slow, and on repeated viewings, I kinda slept over it a few times. And outside of the Autumn Leaf viewing, the setting didn't change much. But in all honesty, even saying all that, even with all of its problems, I still like these two movies. This video is my honest attempt at covering its shortcomings, and my probably futile attempt at sharing this amazing story that's being covered by layers of idol game bullshit. I just really like the base concept, how the band first formed, how they learn to get along with each other, how they deal with setbacks, and eventually them figuring out their true identity, their true purpose. Maybe the real Rosalia was the friends we made along the way. They did it. They did the thing. The thing they have been working on since they first got together. The thing they always knew they would be reaching but never knew when or how. They feel proud. This is quite literally the most ambitious thing they've ever done. For sure this moment will leave a permanent mark on their hearts. Everyone said that even though this stage is bigger than any stage they've ever stood up on before, they didn't feel nervous at all. In fact, they feel like they are shining brighter than they ever have. They have found their calling. Their place if you will. F*** ups were had, but they came out on top. Turns out their friends have been waiting. Tomoe calls for Akko, she brings Inko with her. Hina seems to be very proud of her sister. Sayo went with her too. Yukina was smiling. It's a very rare sight, might I add. If it wasn't to cats, she wouldn't usually be like this. Lisa asks about her unusual face. She's been with Yukina for so long after all. I mean, of course after that anyone would feel proud, right? Someone else is calling for Yukina. Her father. He came to congratulate everyone for their outstanding performance today. Lisa excuses herself out, but it seems like she is part of the family now. She always stays on Yukina's side, literally since they were children after all. He said that he will now look forward to the things they will do in the future. They didn't. They made Daddy proud. With the big event feature wall fest done, they are ready to continue marching forwards. <laughs> And that concludes the two movies for episode of Roselia. This credit scene is very pretty by the way. The story for Roselia contains a healthy mixture of ups and downs, starting with deep grief and overambition, filled with discontent and disagreement, until eventually they all look over their differences and finally move on. It's a really good story that could very well make for a good movie or series given the chance, but alas, that isn't quite achieved here. Bang Dream the anime, excluding the first season, is kinda notorious for trying too much. The first season is notorious for trying too little and single-handedly almost ruined the entire franchise. The second season tried to cram in the story of 6 plus bands with poor balancing, and the movie still isn't quite enough to capture the essence of a single band. The horrible pacing and the myriad of unwritten prerequisites makes the viewing a bit suboptimal. Episode of Roselia is a prime example of what happens when you don't pay attention to the scope of the project. It tries to convey so many things, too many in fact, and it fails to explain some of the core aspects of what makes the story. That's not to say that it is devoid of passion, however. The people behind it really do care about the source material. Sanjigen has been doing this with Pusher for a while now, basically. They know what the story is, and they want to capture as much of it as they could. The flaws of these movies are precisely because they aren't willing to let it go. But I think they kinda shot themselves in the foot. The end result feels kinda rushed, both in pacing and probably in production. The bits they did chose to keep is a bit half-baked. By nature, this movie expects you to be familiar with the characters already. 
which is frankly makes it a bit redundant. I wish it wasn't the way it was because to me this format works. It's more immersive than the visual novels. It's a breath of fresh air. The story came to life. But unfortunately this isn't for everyone. It isn't accessible. It's not to say that it was all for nothing though, as episode of Roselia laid an important groundwork for their future project. For Pop and Dream, they learned their lesson about the whole scope thing and ended up portraying a much, much simpler story, which in turn fixes the pacing dramatically. And the anime specials, the 5th anniversary animation, and Morphonication, they're all really good viewings, well paced with shinier and more polished visuals. And it's all led up to my go, which is very good, holy sh**. My goal was a chance for them to start fresh, and boy did they took it. The art style got a massive bump, there's a lot more variety in the setting, the story is much more impactful, the pacing is much more stable, albeit a bit of a slow burner, and most importantly, it doesn't require stupid amount of game knowledge to actually follow. Yeah, I highly recommend that one, no strings attached. And because it is available everywhere, even for free in some places, I'd reckon you can check that one out for yourself. Bang Dream the anime tend to get better over time. I think they really do want to make a good anime adaptation of their games. And despite everything, I still think episode of Roselia is an improvement compared to their last ones. An important stepping stone. It's definitely an ambitious one. And while it has its own issues, I still think it deserves to be appreciated. If I'm being perfectly honest, as I'm recording the final version of this script, I'm no longer as interested in the franchise compared to how I was. It has been so long since I wrote the first draft of this, I'm practically a changed man. There aren't as many new things from it that caught my eye. Although, I have to say, what really lit my interest for this project was the new Roselia swimsuit cards. No words needs to be spoken. In any case, I appreciate the series for just being there during my lockdown years. For better and for worse, Band Dream turned me into who I am today. And I am thankful for it. In conclusion, bros, Rinko Shirakane, best girl, and watch D4DJ first mix. <laughs>